So our next speaker is the world's most renowned underwater explorer. He has not only pulled up fabled ships and treasures, he's also discovered new life forms that live in the deep. Please help me to welcome archaeological oceanographer Dr. Robert Ballard. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. I'm going to start with an interesting image. I'm going to start with the image of Mars. This is an image of the planet Mars. And you can see it in such beautiful detail, an amazing, amazing act. This is an image of planet Earth. Now what's interesting about these two characters is you get a wonderful view of the surface of Mars. But when you look at our planet, because it's covered by 72% by the oceans, you don't get to see it. The Earth is really covered in a very dense fog, and we don't have that kind of image that we have of Mars or Venus or the inner stony planets of our solar system or their moons. This is an image that's frequently used to depict what it looks like if you were to remove the water of the, of the planet. The problem is this is a cartoon. If you're, if you're a sailor, do not use this as a navigational map. In fact, it's really bad. It's a really bad map. It's based upon earthquake information. When we were monitoring the Soviets to see if they were cheating, we started hearing the earth rumble and we started to realize that the seismicity of the earth was, was not randomly scattered across the planet, but was in narrow belts. And in fact, along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we saw this relationship to seismicity and a mountain range that began to emerge in our consciousness. But it wasn't until really 1960 that we realized that there was this great mountain range beneath our planet. Now what's fascinating is when we went to the moon, we went to the moon, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon in 1969. They found the moon uh, was, was dormant, its volcanoes long extinct. And it wasn't until four years later, after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin successfully walked on the moon, that humans went to the largest mountain range on our own planet. When we descended, I was lucky to be in that first group of aquanauts, so to speak, that descended and went into the deep reaches of the mid-ocean ridge and explored it. There, we found incredible volcanism. We found that the Earth was alive. This was a period of very exciting revolution on our planet, the realization that the Earth was made up of a series of great pieces. We called them crustal plates. And that these plates were dancing in a wonderful ballet either moving away from one another where they created the outer skin of the planet or they descended in head-on collision forming mountain ranges and then our skin of our planet was going back inside recycling itself. We later began to realize that the, the mid-ocean ridge, this great mountain range, was the site of crustal genesis. In fact, this is our present view of the age of the ocean floor. And you'll see that as you get on the axis itself, this, this black line running around the planet is... There's tens of thousands of active volcanoes erupting on the bottom of the ocean. In fact, if you were to clear away all the water and all the dirt and look at the earth as a, as a, as a hard object, you'd see that it's mostly lava flows formed at this crustal site of Genesis. Yet we didn't know it existed in, until the uh, 60s. We didn't descend in it until, until after we went to the moon. Another interesting thing about uh, our explorations of outer space in 1975, we sent the Viking 1 and Viking 2 probes to Mars. They found that the soil on Mars was rich in iron, but they did not see any evidence of life in the soil that they were testing. It wasn't until years later that we actually descended into the, into the, the mountain ranges and found tremendous deposits, not of iron, but tremendous deposits of of copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold being formed along the axis of this entire mountain range. Tremendous metal deposits being formed uh, on the surface of the ocean floor. We also found exotic life forms. I had been taught in my textbooks as a, as a kid that uh, all life on our planet was due to the process of photosynthesis. And knowing that the ocean is, is deep and dark, in fact, most of the Earth is in eternal darkness and will never feel the warmth of the sun, that you do not have plant life in the great depths of the world's oceans. And because you don't have much plant life, you don't have much, uh, uh, much animal life. 
until we made this phenomenal discovery. This discovery, like so many of the discoveries we've done in our explorations, were done by accident. We didn't know these life forms existed. We were down exploring, looking for the missing heat that we had in our models of, of, the, of the genesis of the crust. We, we realized that the mid-ocean ridge was generating heat, but along the axis it wasn't generating enough heat. And so we went in search of the missing heat when we found these entire chimneys of, of hot water coming out of the bottom of the ocean, depositing the minerals. But living around these hydrothermal vents, we found this ex these exotic life forms. Life forms that were not living off the energy of the sun, but living, uh, living off the energy of the earth itself through a process we now realize uh, we call chemosynthesis. It's tremendously shaped our vision of the origin of life, not only on our planet, but the probability of finding it elsewhere, not only in the universe, but within our own solar system. Again, a discovery made by accident, searching on the ocean floor. We found this new life form, the sort of the way in which planets may, in fact, reproduce themselves. Another expedition just recently, in 2001, going along the floor of the ocean, we encounter this phenomenal formation. We called it Lost City because it looked like a, the outline of, a, of, of, of buildings. A process, again, that we did not know existed on our planet. A process where water goes not uh, down to a magma chamber like you have in the mid-ocean ridge, but goes much deeper, goes down into the mantle. And when water goes in, it comes in contact with the mantle, and particularly a mineral called peridotite, it has an exothermic reaction. It's called serpentinization. It's like making concrete. It gives off heat. And that hot water then rises back up and forms these tremendous formations on the sides of these deep uh, fault scarps on the mid-ocean ridge. And when you go underneath and go down underneath and look under, uh, beneath them, you see uh, pools of hot, super hot water. Now, in the mid-ocean ridge discoveries, when we found the hydrothermal vents, they were in a very acidic environment, these extremophiles living in a highly acidic environment. But these particular fluids are at the other end of the spectrum. The water here has a pH of 11, which is equal to Drano. And yet within that hot and highly alkaline water, we found extremophiles as well, demonstrating the tremendous breadth of the living, uh, living system on our planet. They could live under such hostile environments. But the ocean is not only reserved to, to finding a, a natural history, it's also a repository of tremendous human history. Our discovery of the Titanic in, in 1985 was sort of finding the first pyramid of the deep. It was amazing to come in on the ship and see it's, although it sort of had a bad day and lost a little bit in the back, it, it's a high state of preservation was quite amazing. And then we went on to find that the, uh, after exploring the Titanic, finding the German battleship Bismarck, sitting in 16,000 feet of water. And then after that, finding the, the uh, Yorktown from the Battle of Midway. People always ask me, how do I know I found the right ship? This one said Yorktown on the stern. So, yeah. <laughs> But then that quest took us to realize that the deep sea is the largest museum on our planet. The largest museum on our planet. There's more history in the deep sea than all the museums of the world combined. And it's not only contemporary history, it's ancient history. The last uh, 15 years I've been working in the, in the crossroads of civilization, in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. A deep body of water, the average depth of the Mediterranean is 9,000 feet deep. Down off Crete, it gets down to 20,000 feet in depth. And there we have been finding the ancient mariners who crossed these open waters. My first ancient shipwreck I found, this shipwreck sank 100 years before the birth of Christ. It's just sitting there, 3,000 feet of water, out where they never thought ancient mariners went. They always thought they hugged the coastline. We're now finding that, no, they were bold sailors and went out uh, far from land. After finding this trade route between Carthage and Rome, I found another trade route between ancient Phoenicia and the entrance to the Nile. Found a shipwreck that sank from the time of Homer, 750 BC, just sitting there. Just sitting there on the bottom of the ocean for over 2,000 years. But you'll notice that all these shipwrecks have had their uh, wooden members removed. You're just looking at the inorganics. You're looking at what the animals couldn't eat. But there is a place, a very special place, that we're now doing our research where we find a very different situation. It's in the Black Sea. So here we found our Carthaginians. Here we found our Phoenicians. 
But if you go up through the Aegean, through the uh, Dardanelles to the CMRMR and through the Bosporus, you enter a very, very special ocean, the Black Sea. The Black Sea is like no other body of water on our planet. The Black Sea has no oxygen below 200 meters. It's the largest reservoir that dissolves hydrogen sulfide on our planet. And because of this toxicity of hydrogen sulfide, there's no life in the Black Sea. Now, we know the Black Sea's been a crossroads of civilization for thousands and thousands of years. Some people even think this is the site of the ancient biblical flood. We also know that the legend of Jason and the Argonauts going in search of the Golden Fleece took them across the southern coast of the Black Sea. So here we have a, an area that's seen civilization for thousands and thousands of years. And the Black Sea is also a very violent sea. The seas can come up, the fetch is across. I've been in many, many storms over the last 15 years in the Black Sea. So I can only imagine how many shipwrecks have gone to the bottom, but no one, no one was ever allowed into the Black Sea. At least we were not allowed in the Black Sea during the Cold War. I don't know what you were thinking when the Berlin Wall went down. I was thinking, I'm going to the Black Sea. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> And I was the first in with our research team because we knew there were colonies that were connected, the colony in Sinope, the ancient colony of Kerasinesis on the Crimea. We said there must be a trade route here which would take them over 7,000 feet of water. There must have been casualties along that trade route. So we began searching and sure enough on our first attempt, we found perfectly preserved shipwrecks. Wood has a residence time in the deep sea due to these boring organisms about a year and a half. So if you see a wooden ship, you have to say, well, it just sank yesterday. This ship sank 1,500 years ago, and yet it's perfectly preserved. When we were cleaning off the members, we could actually see the ar carpenter's ad mark right here. And we began to excavate the cargo itself. The cargo was in mint condition. It still has beeswax wax drippings on it. It looks like it was made yesterday, not 1,500 years ago. When we return to this site next year and continue our excavations, we expect to begin removing the crew. We expect the crews of these ships to be in absolute perfect condition, far better than the desiccated bodies of the pyramids of the, of the mummies, more like the, the bog people that were thrown into the bogs during the Black Plague where people were afraid to touch them and they were completely mummified. Now you might ask, why is it that we gaze into the stars more than we look down? This is the up experience. It's not the down experience. We are, <laughs> we are conditioned to look to the skies. That's where God is. Down there, that's where the devil is. It's pervasive in our culture. It's pervasive throughout all cultures to look up, not down. To give you an example, NASA's budget. We have two exploratory programs in the United States, one in NASA to explore the heavens, and one in NOAA, their ocean exploration program. NASA's budget to explore the heavens, and I, 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 I think it's an incredible program, and I support it to the most. I just want a little parody. I just want a little respect. NASA's budget for one year would support NOAA's ocean exploration program for 1,000 years. That's the difference. 18.7 billion to 18.7 million. That's Noah's budget to explore 72% of our planet. The goal where no one has gone before on planet Earth. Fortunately, we're starting to get traction. I was able to work mostly on the Senate side with Congress to get us to transfer a ship, this ship here. It used to be called the USNS Capable. It was a surveillance ship. I served in the Navy for 30 years, so I knew it was out of a job. And we transferred it, moved it over to NOAA, and its mission is to explore. It'll be going out. The southern hemisphere is the most unexplored part of our planet. 85% of the southern hemisphere is the oceans. Another thing you may not know is that 50%, 50% of the United States of America lies beneath the sea. 50% of our country that we own all rights to, we own all their resources, do you really think the Easter Bunny just sort of put all the resources on the land part of our planet? There's tremendous living and non-living resources and cultural history beneath the sea. And we are only just now beginning to search the unknown America. In fact, the present law of the Sea Convention will make it possible for us to push our boundaries out even further. And they're now predicting within 10 years, 70% of the United States will lie beneath the sea. 
and most of it is totally unexplored. I also acquired my own ship to be based in, in, in the Mediterranean. Our goal is to have three ships in all the major ocean basins of the world. This one will cover the Black Sea, Red Sea. This is my vehicle systems that I'm putting aboard it right now. We're getting ready for a very special moment come June when we begin our first journey of exploration in a serious way in the Black Sea, Mediterranean, Red Sea, get past the pirates if I'm lucky, and spend a tremendous amount of time in the most unexplored uh, ocean on the planet, the Indian Ocean. Both of these ships are outfitted with an incredible command control center that we work 24 hours a day in our command centers. We're able to go four on eight off watches. So just think, instead of going out to sea for a month that I've been doing for the last 50 years, actually my first expedition was 50 years ago last, this, last summer, we're now going to have the Okeanos out for 10 months a year, working around the clock, exploring. Now since we're, we don't know what we're going to find, we have an interesting challenge. We're, go we're going to actually run both of these ships in their command centers like the emergency room of a hospital. You don't know what an ambulance is going to deliver Sunday morning at 2 in the morning. Open up the back and what's in there? Could be anything. How does a hospital deal with the uncertainty of a, a, an emergency? They have doctors on call. Doctors that are willing to come in, but they have to be within 20 minutes of the hospital. We're going to run this program on a 20-minute time response to a discovery in the most remote part of the planet. So what we're doing is we're connecting our command centers by way of high bandwidth satellite link to a new facility of our university. And yes, we're going to call it the Interspace Center. It comes online in June. This is our initial outfitting. Uh, and this will be linked to both ships. And we will have replicated command centers. So that when a discovery is made, it's instantly seen in our command center ashore. And then using this tremendous internet too, this high bandwidth highway that's going to revolutionize not only our lives but everyone's lives. Working with internet too is like drinking information from a fire hydrant when it has such incredible bandwidth. And fortuitously, all of the major oceanographic institutions are connected to I2. In fact, 80% of all the oceanographers in the United States are at 12 locations, and they're all on this network. So what we're doing right now, getting ready for June, is we're installing remote command centers at all the major oceanographic institutions. They're not very expensive. They're less than a car, about $21,000. But then we're able to actually network science aboard. But we also use the excitement of our exploration program and our ships of exploration. My ship, the Nautilus, will always carry young kids, mostly middle school kids. I have two children's foundations focusing on K-12 through education, mostly focused on middle school. The game for a scientist or an engineer is over by the eighth grade, not beginning. It's over if you haven't got them taking those extra classes. We are also working in public schools in Rhode Island. All the schools are on I-2 already, and we're installing in libraries com complete command centers so that the children can just have the bell ring and they run down to the library to see what's happening on our research ships. We're also working with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. This is a command center we just built in Greater Scottsdale, Arizona, where 15,000 kids at risk now go on our expeditions. We're even pulling the gangs off the street to go to a part of the planet they've never seen before and more than likely will never have the opportunity to do it any other way. We even give control of our vehicle systems to children. Now, I wouldn't let an adult do this. I'm sorry, you're just not qualified. <laughs> but your children are. Here's a young boy being given command control of our vehicle system with minimal amount of experience. Now, all that Xbox is experience is not all that bad. But what you're seeing is the beginning of electronic travel. What we're trying to do is to implement this, what we call it telepresence, the ability to move the spirit around, move them to the bottom of the ocean at the speed of light. But this kind of electronic travel is going to become pervasive, particularly when Internet 2 hits your own home. It'll change you forever. It's already changed my life and how I deal with my family. I explore more than I've ever explored before, and I'm spending more time at home with my wife and children than I've ever spent in my entire career. So I'm very excited about this potential, not only because I see it as a wonderful way for me to continue the explorations of this wonderful planet, because I think this planet has a lot to offer us that we, we need to focus on. 
We've only seen one-tenth of one percent of the deep sea. All the major discoveries I made that were important discoveries were all done by accident. I'm not that good. There must be so much more down there to be discovered, and I'm hoping through the use of this technology and our ability to go into the classrooms of our schools, we'll be able to excite the next generation of explorers. The generation that's in middle school right now will explore more of Earth than all previous generations combined, and I think I may have a new engineer or scientist right now. Thank you. I think I probably speak for all of us when I say, on your next expedition, please take me with you. <laughs> that really sounds amazing. I, okay, I do, think it's, I do think it's interesting and strange that so many people are interested in outer space when we have so much in our own backyard. But it, it does make me wonder, as you find these new biological life forms, what, what you discover are these new biological strategies that no one had thought of before, these new life codes that are possible. So what does that suggest to you about life on other planets, about those possibilities? Very resilient and very probable. I think when I, after the discovery of hydrothermal vents and the chemosynthetic system that it's driven by, you look out and you know there's much more life out there than you ever thought. But I also remember that I'm probably going to spend my life on this planet. I know our next speaker will, will talk about uh, going to other places. I just think that most of us will be here. And I really, uh, I, I really think it's important to, to realize that we have no program. There's no federal funding about moving humans out onto the ocean. We only live on 18% of the planet. And yet there's absolutely no strategy, no funding, no program whatsoever to look at how would you move humans out onto the ocean. I think we'll go to the bottom of the ocean. That would be cruel and unusual punishment. It might be a great penal colony down there, <laughs> but I don't advocate going into the world of total darkness. But I look at that incredible living space off our shores, and I think we'll be out there sooner than anywhere else. Great. Thank you so Thank much, you. Robert.